call black everything Everything black, culture over everything Y'all, we taking it back, black Welcome to Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined today via Skype by Professor Lerone A. Martin, Assistant Professor of Religion and Politics in the John T. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics at Washington University in St. Louis. He's the author of the new book, Preaching on Wax, the Phonograph and the Shaping of Modern American, Af Modern African American Religion, just published by New York University Press. How are you doing today, Professor Martin? Good, how are you? Uh, your colleague, our friend Marla Frederick, says of your book, important and timely, Preacher on Wax insists that we reframe our understanding of the spiritual impulses, racial politics, and commercial influences that mediate a rich strand of African American religion. <laughs> Uh, it is a wonderful book. Uh, it's a timely book, definitely, particularly in the context of the ways that we understand black religious discourse to be so heavily mediated in this moment. You know, whether it's through the use of Twitter and Facebook. You know, I have a, a preacher cousin in Baltimore and they were snowed in, you know, so she just did her sermon on Facebook, <laughs> you know, this, this weekend. And, and of course, there's a rich history throughout the 20th century of, of African-American preachers obviously using the radio as medium. But you really go to an early point in time and when ministers took advantage of this new technology known as the phonograph. Talk a little bit how you came to this subject matter and, and, and particularly in the context of black religious traditions. Well, thank you for your, your kind words about the book. I greatly appreciate it. Um, I came to the project as in a certain sense of uh, self-discovery. Um, I was raised in a home that was very uh, uh, familiar with televangelism. And as I went off to school and to college, um, I began to realize in talking with my friends that my experience was a particular experience that some of my friends uh, didn't have the experience of listening to televangelism and things of that nature. So as I began to matriculate through school, I figured out that my experience wasn't quite uh, cataloged or chronicled in some of the uh, literature on African-American religion. And that's what led me to the question of how did all this start? How did African-Americans become so um, accustomed to uh, consuming and pr practicing religion through media? And uh, that's, that's how I kind of came to the project. You know, you mentioned in the context of this book that this tradition emerges at the same t time that African Americans are starting to record music uh, in the recording industry. You talk about OK Records, um, the significance of this new technology of, of race music. Uh, but people are ambivalent about race music. You know, in, in some ways, you know, clearly in the terms of the black church, you know, there's a whole lot of sinfulness, <laughs> you know, that's taking place <laughs> in the context of these records. And, and at least these records are played in context, you know, rather physical and otherwise, you know, that in which folks clearly believe there were vices that, <laughs> you know, that, that were going down in that context. But yet there were some ministers who were forward thinking enough to think that this was also a way that if they were going to combat you know, this emergence of urban entertainment, they had to use the same mediums in order to do that. Exactly. Um, Reverend Calvin Dixon takes the name of Black Billy Sunday, <laughs> connects with uh, Columbia Records in 1925 to begin to record and sell his sermons. And that's how this phenomenon kicks off. Um, he was forward thinking enough, as you stated, to say that there's uh, no point in conceding the phonograph and the consumer market over to the sinful vices and the likes of Bessie Smith and Ma Rainey and others, but that uh, this is the best way for us to engage the market and to combat their influence. You know, in many ways, your book is uh, kind of a foundational piece for the work that Jonathan Walton did a few years ago, you know, really looking at this generation of televangelists. Um, and, and he makes a, a similar claim, in fact, that many of these folks really understood it. If they wanted to reach people, they had to use the medium where people were. Um, and, and of course, there's some tensions that are associated with this. You, you talk about some of the ways in which the recorded technologies of, of black preaching really impact upon the black community. You know, this idea of turning black Christianity into a, a mass produced commodity. Um, you know, ultimately, what do you think are the impacts uh, of, of really making black religion something to be bought or sold? Um, you know, I, one of the later titles of your chapters, when you talk about the selling of black souls, you know, it, it does raise some questions about, you know, is there a way to maintain a certain kind of integrity 
around black religious discourse if it's being reduced to something that's marketable and, and commodifiable? Right. I mean, I think I would say in brief that um, I think it's twofold. I think the first is that it does provide ministers with an opportunity to get their message out. It provides them an opportunity to be uh, relevant, to be engaged in, in current cultural trends. Yeah. Um, and it brings a level of popularity and notoriety. I think the drawback is that um, the market at times can begin to actually shape the kind of gospel <laughs> yeah. that the yeah. ministers begin to preach and, and proclaim. And I think that the means at times ends up becoming the end. And so some ministers will say, well, I'm using this particular technology or the market as a means to reach people. Um, but I think in the end sometimes, uh, just the market and the technology become the end, um, just becoming popular through technology, becoming popular in the market, selling well in the market, at times just becomes the end and into itself. I think that's probably the drawback, one of the drawbacks. You're watching Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined today by Professor Lerone A. Martin, who's Assistant Professor of Religion and Politics at the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics at Washington University in St. Louis. He's the author of the new book, Preaching on Wax, The Phonograph and the Shaping of Modern African-American Religion, just published by New York University Press. You know, one of the things that this also creates is this uh, tradition, a generation of celebrity preachers. Um, you mentioned listening to televangelists growing up, you know, at, in, in your home. You're probably a little younger than I am. You know, my memories in that regard are thinking about Reverend Ike on television <laughs> in the 1970s. And, and I was probably too young to really be paying attention to folks like Father Divine and Daddy Grace. Um, but we all are familiar, for instance, of a figure like, you know, Reverend C.L. Franklin, who took the combination of these records and his radio broadcast and really turned himself into a, almost a megastar. You know, that, you know, at some point, probably more popular than his daughter would become, you know, much later. Can you talk about some of these early celebrities who, who understood how to use the medium, both in terms of how to reach a wide audience, but also in terms of what they are doing in terms aesthetically, what you're doing in terms of a, a preaching tradition in that regard? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I discuss in the book, I focus on Reverend James Gates and his experience of celebrity. And I argue that this experience of celebrity, both of um, the sort of accoutrements of celebrity, so the cars that Reverend Gates drove, <laughs> kind of clothes, the house, but all of this that many of these preachers, celebrity preachers, see it as a means to an end. Again, they see that celebrity is a way to bolster their authority um, within American life, particularly at a moment in the 1920s as the cultural authority of ministers is in decline and being challenged by uh, the new Negro and, and, and law and business physicians and that sort. So I argue that celebrity comes along as a way to bolster their authority alongside the rise of black professionals. Um, and it's, it's great to, it was great to research to see the rise of celebrity in the 1920s and these sermons being sold in the marketplace, literally alongside the likes of Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington and Bessie Smith. Um, and it's, a, it's an interesting moment in our time and I think it's a moment that continues today as it relates to the how ministers use celebrity as a means to an end. You know, did you, there's a lot of stuff going on, you know, as you mentioned in the context of this historical moment. You have the New Negro Movement, um, you talk about what's happening in the black church, you have this first generation of really, you know, black musical celebrities that are reaching mainstream audiences, the, the Louis Armstrongs, the Duke Ellingsons, um, exactly. Bessie Smith, you know, all the black women blues singers. And, and I wonder how you figure a person like Thomas Dorsey into this. Um, you know, in some ways, he, he's taking that same black tradition but doing something very specific around music, particularly in the selling of his sheet music. And, and one of the things I see that are interesting comparisons between what Dorsey is doing and, of course, what Minister Gates is doing is the, this idea of an independent black business model. You know, that, that is, you know, separate and distinct from, you know, again, when he goes after, when Reverend Gates goes after the chain stores, you know, you understand the significance that, that regardless of what's going on in terms of religious content, these are folks who also understand the significance of black owned business. That's right. That's right. Uh, Reverend Gates is uh, brilliant in that regard. Um, he refuses to sign with an agent, um, or excuse me, refuses to sign with a record label and just signs with an agent, which allows them to record for any uh, label that he wants to, any label that will pay him well enough. 
And so he has this sort of independent ministry thing going uh, with the record uh, 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 record companies. And so uh, you're right, it's definitely an independent black business model in a way that trying to have ownership and control of, 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 of their product that they produce. And so Reverend Gates um, copyrights many of his sermons, uh, uh, and many other artists did not do this, even jazz and blues artists. So Reverend Gates, like Dorsey, as you mentioned, was uh, very, 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 very savvy. And Dorsey mentions in one interview that he knew Reverend Gates, that they, they talked several times, met in the studio several times. And so one can only imagine the type of advice and dialogue that they exchanged about really how to survive and what was really a cutthroat uh, business. Yeah. You're watching Left of Black. We're joined today by Professor Lerone A. Martin, who's Assistant Professor of Religion and Politics at the John C. Danford Center on Religion and Politics at Washington University in St. Louis. He authored a new book, Preaching on Wax, The Phonograph and the Shaping of Modern American, African American Religion. NYU Press. Uh, I imagine you had to listen to a lot of sermons <laughs> in the course of the research uh, on this wonderful book. Um, so I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> and, 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 you know, based on the work that you do and, and, and just in your voice, I know at some point you had to have been a preacher <laughs> or aspired to be a preacher yourself, uh, if not a radio disc jockey. <laughs> <laughs> But give me your short list of, of five black preachers that are kind of must listen to's to understand the black uh, sermonic tradition. <laughs> well, let me address first that uh, I I, uh, I did go to divinity school and I, I did at the time think that I was going that route. Uh, I thought that I had uh, removed all that residue off of me, but clearly I haven't. <laughs> Um, I would say, um, as far as your question, thank you for that. I would say Reverend Gates for sure. Reverend James Gates, I think, um, is foundational, as well as um, Reverend J.C. Burnett out of Kansas City, who probably, from what we can tell, sold um, the most sermons uh, during this period up to 1945. It looks like he's one of his sermons, The Downfall of Nebuchadnezzar, shipped almost 90,000 copies. Wow. It's probably one of the <laughs> popular ones. So I would say J.C. Burnett, the downfall of Nebuchadnezzar. I would say um, F.W. McGee, who was Reverend F.W. McGee, who was one of the more popular Pentecostal ministers who brings into the studio drums and horns and clarinet, the whole uh, gamut of uh, instruments you would hear at a local jazz club. Uh, and I would say Reverend Leora Ross, um, because Leora Ross is one of the few African-American women who was able to succeed and navigate um, the um, record, record business as a preacher. I would say those four, and I would say once you hear those four, you'll be able to better understand someone, yeah. like Reverend C.L. Franklin, who Nick Salvatore chronicles in his book, was raised in Mississippi hearing these sermons on yeah. wax, right. which ultimately shapes Reverend C.L. Franklin's preaching style. And I think from there, you can get a clearer picture of uh, African-American preaching today. What's next for you? Next, I'm uh, researching uh, religious broadcasters and their relationship to the FBI. Wow. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Well, we, we look forward to having you back on the show to talk about that project when it's out. Thank you. I appreciate it. We've been joined today by Professor Lerone A. Martin, Assistant Professor of Religion and Politics at the John T. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics at Washington University in St. Louis. He is the author of the new book, Preaching on Wax, the Phonograph and the Shaping of Modern African American Religion, published by New York University Press. Thank you for joining us today, Professor Martin. Thank you for having for me. It's great. Black lights and boots burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Black, 